Hebrews chapter 3 tonight. If you want to get a little ahead uh, as far as turning to other passages, we will also be in Psalm 95 and Deuteronomy chapter 1. So if you can keep if you keep that in mind, maybe it'll make it so it takes a little less time for us to transition. Really, Hebrews chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 4 uh, are are uh, our full context. So if I were to preach, uh, you know, it's kind of tough sometimes when you when you're preaching the uh, when you're preaching the message that is in the scripture. It's tough to leave out parts to leave things out. So we could do one of two things. We could just read Hebrews chapter three and verse four and chapter four, and then go home, or we could read some of the verses and I'll preach. <laughs> but we can't do both because they're packed. They're absolutely loaded. That's why I want to encourage you while we're uh, doing our series, while we're doing our study, make it a personal study. Own the Scripture. My goal as your pastor when I preach is not for you to walk away and say, well, pastor put together a great message. My goal is for you to go away and know what the Bible says and be convinced of it and know where it's at and be able to just internalize it and so that you can teach it. We're going to see in a couple of weeks that believers are expected to grow to the place that they can teach the Word of God. It's a little daunting, isn't it? Uh, I, I had the privilege of, of course, being born in a Christian home, had the privilege of going to a Christian school and being forced to memorize massive amounts of Bible verses. I had the privilege uh, in high school of uh, being on a Bible quiz team. And the requirement for I was I was captain of the Bible quiz team. The requirement for the captain captain would you would be you'd have to read learn the whole the the whole entire whatever portion that you're Bible quizzing over. So it's first and second Corinthians. I'd have to memorize both first and second Corinthians and know them to the point where you could ask the question uh, according to First Corinthians chapter one and verse nine. Who you know and you you couldn't just stand up and quote the verse. You had to answer the question. Whoever or who and they would they would finish the question ask it. And you'd have to know it that well. So I had the privilege of um, getting to know a lot of Scripture, being taught a lot of Scripture. And uh, then I went to Bible college and uh, learned Bible for uh, four years, and uh, biblical languages minor. And I said all that to say this. Uh, the first time I really got put in a place of having to teach, I felt inadequate. I felt like I don't know enough to teach anybody. You ever feel like that? Because all you know is what you know. Right, and you can't. Uh, it'd be interesting if we could. Well, for me, I'd be interested in looking at what some of y'all know. If you could just uh, calculate it on the basis of how much it is, like the volume of what you know. But if you're a growing believer and you're adding to your faith, you know a lot of things that a lot of people don't, and you could teach it. And so I want to encourage you when we go to the Word of God, when we study the Scripture, learn the Scripture. And you'll be amazed. You'll, you'll begin teaching in conversations how it'll begin first. You'll be with somebody that's either not saved or who's a new believer, and they'll have a question, and you'll just answer the question. You won't realize it, but you'll be teaching them the answer to the question. You'll be saying, well, you know, I, there's this verse in the Bible, and you open up and so forth. And that's what we want to do. We want to develop that. So I want to leave you with that, and I encourage you study. Study the passage of Scripture right now. Uh, we're in, in uh, three books of the Bible that we're preaching through systematically. Sunday morning, it's the Gospel of John. Sunday evening, it's 1 Samuel. And Wednesday night, it's Hebrews. Okay, so you ready? Let's look at a few verses in Hebrews. And <clears throat> let's go ahead and read verses 1 and 2. And uh, then we'll <clears throat> read verses 5 and 6 and 12. And that's all we'll read for our context tonight. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling... Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now, verse uh, 5, And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Notice verse 6, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Father, please help us tonight. Help us to do justice to the Scripture. We cannot study and examine every bit of this passage, but help us to be able to really uh, be convinced of the superiority of Jesus Christ as the Son who was 
faithful in a much greater house and help us to be reminded that we have been partakers, we're brethren in that same household. And I pray that it would encourage us to endure and encourage us to go forward in the faith we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's do a little review just so that we can set our context for this evening. Uh, Hebrews is written to whom? Who is it addressed to? Who? Jewish believers. Okay, Jewish Christians. Okay? Uh, what's the circumstance? What is the material or the purpose of the letter of Hebrews? Okay, so that's one of the themes in Hebrews is Jesus is better than a lot of different things. Why is that important? Yeah, because because believers are going back. They're 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 stopping going forward in the faith, and they're going back into Judaism. What are the circumstances that are uh, making them go back into Judaism? What makes it more comfortable for them to do that? Persecution. Persecution. They're persecuted because they're Jewish, and they're really at the time of the writing of this letter. They're about two years from the destruction of Jerusalem and the obliteration of of the Jewish people to the point where every Jewish person is not allowed to live in Jerusalem anymore. So it's tough being Jewish. Worse than that, though, is the fact that not only are you ostracized because you're Jewish, but now you're a Christian and now the Jews don't like you. You've got no one, you're alone. And so a lot of, of uh, Jews are just like, well, you know, it's bad enough, you know, it's bad enough being Jewish, but I can't, you know, I can't have my family forsake me. You know, I can't have, I can't go through these things. And it happens today. You trust Jesus as your Savior. And a lot of Jewish families say, I have no son. Mother say, I have no son anymore. Mother won't speak to you again the rest of your life. It, it happens. It's not something that's isolated. Well, you know, it's easy to talk about, you know, to use the words, the sentences, but when the, cir the uh, circumstantiation becomes real, there's one of my words, uh, when it becomes real, you realize, wow. You know, think of, a, think of your mom. Think of your dad never speaking to you again, disowning you. It's, it's not just a, well, you know, it's, it's, you know whoever, whoever won't leave father and mother and, and forsake father and mother and be my disciple is not worthy of the kingdom. Well, nobody's fit or worthy for the kingdom of heaven. But the reality is that people had their families turn against them. And so they thought, well, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, turn away from Jesus. I'm just not going to go to church anymore. You know, a lot of times parents, I've met Jewish people that have told me, my parents are just asking me. They're asking me just to not be public about my faith because of the pressure that comes on them from the rabbis and from the synagogue and so forth. And so, you know, would I be lost if I, if, if I just stopped going to church? Well, how are you saved? By going to church? Saved by faith. So would you be lost if you stopped going to church? The answer is no. And so in many people's minds, it was they were the hardship justifiably uh, or it justified the decision to go back in the faith. That's a tough circumstance. And so the letter of Hebrews is written to urge with really two tones. What are the two ways that the Jewish believer is urged not to go back on their faith? What are the two ways that Hebrews is, is, presents itself? Okay, that's the fact of it. What's the, the manner like? Uh, what are the two ways of, of convincing them not to go back? Think of Jude. Think of Jude in the last couple of verses. Was it faith? He was pushing about faith? Yeah. No. <laughs> no, the two ways. What? Compassion and fear. In other words, in... Hebrews, we see five warning passages that are frightening. Major warning passages that make you say, you better look out. You better think about what you're doing. You better think about what it means. You better think what the consequences are going to be. You better look out. The other passages are, understand where you're coming from, but look at Jesus and tell me that it's not worth it. In other words, it's, a, it's, a, it's just an urging. And so the first argument that we saw is if you go back into Judaism, you're going to go back into a religion where the highest thing that's worshipped is really angels. Jews are big about angels. Got names for all the angels. And in Judaism, they 
uh, you know, they, they got, it's just, just it's very similar to Catholicism, you know. Catholicism has a saint for this and a saint for that, and Judaism has an angel for this and an angel for that. And, you know, you're going to be praying to angels, you're going to be thinking and talking. A lot of the discussion is going to be about divine encounters with angels, uh, and that's a lot of what you're going back into. And you're going to go from worshiping Jesus to worshiping angels. So let's think about Jesus. Let's think about Jesus. Jesus Christ is better than the angels. Which of the angels said he, speaking of God, at any time, sit thou here until I make thine enemies thy footstool? And the answer to that hypothetical question, or that, that not hypothetical, but answer that question, none. rhetorical question, none. No. No angel's ever been told that, only the Son of God. Uh, which of the angels? And he goes through those arguments. We can't go over that message again. And then, so the first reason that we're told not to go back into Judaism is Jesus is better than the angels. Why are you going to worship something that's not as good as Jesus? And the second reason is because, consider this, you've also been made higher than the angels. And how nonsensical is it for a higher being to, uh, to worship a lower one? doesn't make any sense if we've been if we're going to rule and reign with Christ and we're going to be above the angels for us to worship an angel that doesn't have the position of sons. And then we're reminded that we've been called brethren. Again, that's a warm argument, isn't it? That's the love argument. That's the compassion argument. And tonight we're going to see the same thing again. We're going to see Jesus is not only superior to the angels, but right away we move right into calling Jesus our high priest and we we're talking about his faithfulness. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of Jews would say, well, you know, Moses, the law of Moses is what we're going into Judaism for. We're going to go back to the law, to the law of Moses. And so we're told, well, faith, Moses was faithful in all his house. Let's, but let's think about what it was like in the days of Moses. You say Moses, Moses, Moses. But it was sort of like in Jesus' day when they said, well, Abraham's our father. And what did Jesus say? You're your father, the devil. He, he said, you know, he said, I can raise up of these stones, children unto Abraham. Uh, your rank or your legitimacy because of your, who you've descended from is not a valid argument. But Moses is another one for the Jewish people. Well, Moses, we have the law of Moses. And Moses, Moses, Moses. And so this passage of Scripture is going, <coughs> excuse me, to kindly remind them of Moses' reception in his day. Let's talk about Moses in his day. And let's just chat about it here just a little bit this evening. One of the best illustrations in the Bible for the simplicity of salvation by faith, which is simply looking at Jesus Christ, is Moses in the, and the serpent in the wilderness, isn't it? What brought about the events that precipitated Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness? What? No, they were murmuring. What? Yeah, they were murmuring against God, against Moses, and they said, you know, there's there's no bread, and we hate the bread. You remember that? I love that. You know, we, there's no bread, and as for this light bread, our, my, our soul loatheth it. We don't want like, there's no bread, and we don't like the bread either. You know, is the argument. It always cracks me up about the argument of God against Moses. You know, here we are in the wilderness, and there's no bread. And the bread's terrible. <laughs> That's the attitude they had. Um, now they were, who were they complaining against? God and Moses. So now we got people that are going back into a religion and they're reminded, okay, you want to talk about Moses? Yeah, you know, Moses was really held in high esteem in his day. I mean, they treated him great. I mean, Moses, I, you know, high and lifted up prophet. Not so much in his day, was it? So you want to go back to, you know, you're going to, Moses is going to be the apostle, if you will, is going to be the high priest that you're going to look to instead of Jesus. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't have anything bad to say about Moses. It says he was faithful in all his house. Well, that's a pretty good compliment, isn't it? But then it says, let's consider, though, that in Moses' house, he was a minister. That is, he was a servant in his house, but Jesus Christ in his house is a son. You want to go with rank or importance. It's a great thing to know somebody who serves in a high place, isn't it? You ever gone on a tour somewhere, somebody's mansion because you knew somebody that worked there or something like that? You ever been in on something because you knew somebody that knew... And 
Uh, you know, we did that. Remember Maymont Estates? That was you're thinking of, baby. Is it Maymont? No, not Maymont. What's the name of it? What's the name of that place? Something. There's a there's a place that I had the privilege with Gary Noakes of going to hunt, like a really great hunt, a deer hunt, and uh, <clears throat> it was on an estate that was deeded from King George in Virginia, uh, and a beautiful place. It had the the mansion that was there, and Brother Gary Noakes is. Noakes got his brother the job of managing this state, which is about 750 acres of just the most beautiful country in Virginia. Rolling Hills and the original mansion, and of course owned by the family, a pretty well-known family. We, Melissa toured all the house. I didn't care to. I was very, more interested in killing deer. But uh, <laughs> Melissa toured the whole house, and you know what? We didn't meet the family. But we knew somebody that was a servant in the house. Took care of the property, and we got to see things is something to know somebody that's in some kind of a place it's a whole different thing though to, to be friends with the, one of the kids isn't it it's a whole different matter now that's an understatement because we're talking about the son of god who we've been just told moments before that we are that calls us brethren in other words he's given us his rank his position in god's house now what's better? I mean, we know Moses would keep his law. Liar. He didn't even like Moses. Or we're brethren in God's house. Well, that's a kind argument, isn't it? It's like just think about the apostle and the high priest of your confession, of your profession, of your calling. Consider him the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. And then there's a warning. Look at verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you'll hear His voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. You ever think of the implications of people walking through the Red Sea on dry ground and not believing in God? Of people watching God and saying, Moses, hit the rock in the desert with your rod and water comes out of it. Of people seeing God's presence with them as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and not believing in God. You say, Pastor, they didn't believe in the existence of God. No, when we talk about not believing in God, we're not talking about believing in His existence. There's no one who doesn't believe in the existence of God. And that's honestly the truth. Now, you may not like to retain God in your knowledge, like Romans chapter 1 says, until you convince yourself that there's no God. But everyone knows there's a God, and everybody believes there's a God. When we talk about believing in God, we're talking about receiving Him. We're talking about bowing to Him. About looking to Him. And literally, the children of Israel for 40 years wandered in the wilderness and were miraculously protected and provisioned by God Almighty and complained about him the whole time, never liked him. Ever think on that? Brought them out of Egypt with a strong hand. Took them from being slaves and said, we're going to start a nation where God is your king. <laughs> I'm appreciative of the leadership in our country right now, to be honest with you. But the fact of the matter is, can you imagine? <laughs> you can you imagine being just a nation? I'm talking about... You know, I'm talking about your country, your nation, your nationality, having God for a king. You know, the Russians are threatening. <laughs> Who cares? God's our king. Uh, you know, we need to, we're supposed to drive out the Philistines. They're pretty, pretty mean people. Remember what David said? Who is this person? Who is this guy? Yeah. How, does he, how does he dare? Because <laughs> God's our king. Yeah. God's our king. Okay, do you see the difference? Okay, you go back into a religion where Moses, 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 you didn't even like Moses. Okay, so Deuteronomy 1, are you there? Deuteronomy chapter 1, we'll be in Psalm 95 next. Let's just look at this briefly. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Uh, and, and look down at verse, <clears throat> oh, let's see here. Uh, 
34, I guess. Or, well, let's go down to verse 31. If you were to read in Deuteronomy all the way up to this point, you'd see God taking Israel through their national history, explaining to them where they've been, where they've come from, and all He'd done for them in each instance. And it's really a good summary of the Exodus. If you want to summarize Exodus, Deuteronomy 1 just summarizes it really, really well. I did this and this and this and this and this. But here's the end result of it, verse 30, uh, uh, 31. <clears throat> let's look at verse 30, I guess. No, nope, let's look at verse 29. Should we back up to verse 1? No, let's stop at 29. Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God which goeth before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness, where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son. Isn't that interesting, that reference right there? That's interesting because that is the scripture that the Holy Spirit's referring to in Hebrews when it's talking about we're his sons. We, he's, he, he, we're God's children. In all the way that you went until you came into this place. And then verse 32 is astonishing. Yet in this thing you did not, what's that next word? Believe. Believe the Lord your God. Who went in the way before you to search you out a place to pitch your tents in, in fire by night, to show you by what way you should go and in a cloud by day. Well, that's explicitly stated, isn't it? And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your father, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon unto his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord was angry with me for your sakes. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. Now let's stop here and ask the question, Was Moses faithful in all his house, according to Hebrews chapter 3? Yeah. Yes. And did Moses get to go into the land? No. No. So let's go back to a religion that esteems Moses but doesn't esteem Jesus. Now again, the scripture's not Moses bashing here. Moses was a faithful servant of the Lord, wasn't he? Yeah. Highly esteemed by God. God loved Moses. God mightily used Moses. When you want to argue about who is the greatest prophet, you've got to discuss Moses. You know, if we're going to have the goat argument, like everybody's goat argumenting about everything right now, everybody talks about the goat. Who's the goat? Is it Tom Brady? Who's the goat? Is it Michael Jordan? Who's the goat? You know, let's talk about prophets. Who's the goat? Well, Jesus said, you know, John the Baptist was the greatest man born among women. Uh, but if we're going to talk about things that God did through individuals, Moses is there, isn't he? Tell me a prophet that God did more miracles through or had a longer uh, period of time in which God used him than Moses. And so here's Moses, great man, but did he enter into, the, into his rest? Did he go into the land of Canaan? Tragically, the answer is no. Okay, so let's go to Psalm 95, and let's look at another passage that's specifically quoted in Hebrews chapter 3. I want to read the whole psalm because it, it helps us to uh, really... Get, encapsulate the idea of who God is versus who man is. O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is His also. The sea is His. And he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Could you say that about any man? None of these things. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the sheep of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We go from saying that to today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. As in the, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Now that is, that is a load to digest there, isn't it? Tempted me, proved or tested me, and saw my work. And here, the Hebrew believers who are familiar with both of these passages of Scripture 
are being reminded that you've seen. Hebrews chapter 6 tasted of the heavenly gift. Tasted. You know who Jesus is. You've experienced who Jesus is. You know who God is. And then, 40 years long was I grieved with this generation, said it's a people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways. What a tragedy for people to have tasted, been proved to, seen God work, and their ultimate conclusion is unbelief. Yeah. And be honest with yourself when you're not in fellowship with the Lord. Ask yourself the question, what did Jesus do to me? How has God wronged me? I'm, a, I'm, I'm actually incredibly amazed at the audacity of some people to accuse God. Can I say to you that if you be open-minded and fair about it, like anyone who could look on your situation could be, You'll never have anything to ever accuse God of. You'll never be able to say, my life stinks because ultimately you'll know you don't deserve to have the one you've got. You deserve hell. And Jesus died for your sin. Who got the bad deal? What's God ever done to you? Man, when you're tempted to be unfaithful to the Lord or excuse and say, well, you know something? God hasn't done as much for you. You ever heard the, you know, God's done more for them, and so they're more, you know, we, we say it, saw in the Scripture, right? Who's going to love the person more, the person who's forgiven much or the person who's forgiven little? Now listen, friend, is there anyone who's actually been forgiven little in the context of salvation? You ever just evaluate that? People take the yeah. statement and talk about, well, this woman, you know, in the eyes of people, you know, is an adulterer, or this person, you know, well, who does God love? People that <clears throat> have been forgiven much or people who are forgiven little. Well, God loves them all. But who actually has been forgiven little? Raise your hand, would you please? Stand up. <laughs> Dare you. <laughs> See? Not I. It's incredible, isn't it, that truth? And the reminder here is that these people tested me, they tempted me, they, they did always provoke me. With the exception, you remember, in, Psalm, or in Deuteronomy 1, the exception of Joshua and Caleb. They provoked God. Okay, now that brings us to our context. And you know what? We're probably going to have to, that's probably as far as we're going to make it this evening. We're going to have to kind of wind down a little bit, maybe pick up here again next week. But I want to look at verse 11 uh, of, verse, of ch chapter 3 of Hebrews, which of course reminds us, reminds us of what God said ultimately. It's just it's a quotation of Psalm 95. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. God said, this people have always provoked me. You know, that's the thing they say never to say in a relationship, right? Absolute statements. You always, you never. The truth of the matter is, though, God continually pacified a rebellious people. There's no water. I'll give you water. There's no food. I'll give you food. We're tired of bread. I'll give you quail. We don't like Moses. Well, I mean, just, and you know, the thing about it is, you know, I don't like ungrateful people. Do you? You like doing things for people and having them complain. How many of you all like taking a homeless guy to Burger King and buying him a Whopper and then him tell you he don't like onions? You know what I'm talking about? Like you do something for somebody like, you know, I don't like Burger King anyway. Give me that food back, man. See if I buy you anything ever again. I'm telling you, for 40 years, the children of Israel, we had leeks and we had garlic in Egypt. <laughs> well, here you got God. Yeah, amen. Right. See what I'm saying? And like, think, of the, think of the logic behind it. 40 years, God said, well, then I'll do this for you. We want bread. Well, I'll give you bread every single day and you don't have to work for it. Just pick it up off the ground. Yeah. <laughs> we want meat. I'll give you quail. Just pick it up off the ground. We're afraid of Pharaoh. I'll just kill him for you. We're everything that they said, God said, okay, I'll do this for you. Okay, I'll do that for you. You ever just put up with a brat for a while? And then when his parents leave, you spank him? I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I've, I've never done that. Okay, I just want you to know. But uh, I felt like it. I will glare at a child at Walmart when his mom turns around. 
I'll just tell you that honestly. He's being a brat. I'll give him the look like, and he'll be, and his mom like, why don't we quit doing whatever? What happened? <laughs> now, listen, what do you think God felt after 40 years of, rah, 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 rah. and it gives them everything they need. 40 years and their sandals didn't wear out. You know, it's like getting your comfy jeans and they never wear holes in them. I mean, wouldn't that be nice? You know, I mean, yeah, 40 years, God took care of them in the wilderness. Never lacked anything, never needed anything. Everything was taken care of by God. And whatever they asked for, God just gave them. And they still didn't believe Him. They still didn't want Him. They still wanted to be slaves in Egypt. And so after 40 years, God said, I swear, you'll never go into the promised land. It's taken so long to get there. God said, you know what? You're never getting there. So look at verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Verse 12 of chapter 3. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Now, is this a loving passage or a warning passage? Warning. It scares me. Frightens me when I see that attitude in me. You ever seen something in yourself and thought, I don't like that? <laughs> I say, every time I, every time I have to confess something to God, I say, God, you know, I just can't stand me. I don't like my attitude. I just, you know, you didn't do anything to deserve. To, you, I, you did everything for me. I'm just lousy. Man, I'll tell you, when I see an evil heart of unbelief in my heart, my friend, and I see... Hebrews chapter 3, and then I remember what happened to the people who said rrr, 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 about God. You ever had a day where you just realized how blessed you were? And you realized you really hadn't been as thankful as you ought to have been? Truth of the matter is, I gaze about this room, we're a bunch of privileged people. We've got it. We've got it made, don't we? Do you have a day where you're just kind of like, well, I shouldn't have to do this, and I shouldn't have to put up with that, and I should it's like, just shut up. <laughs> you're like the children of Israel, they're like, we don't like the bread that God provided. Better watch out who you gripe about. Father, please help us this evening as we look at this evil heart of unbelief. To be willing and to be open to identify it in ourselves and get it out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we dismiss this evening, I want to take some prayer requests.